I'm one of the Robertos that made this paper. And uh, what is after interpretation repair? So in a sentence, uh, after interpretation repair is uh, for, abs for abs interpretation what uh, counterexample guide that abstraction refinement is for model change. For those that know Seeger, Seeger is almost 20 years old, is in a pretty effective way for refining abstractions in model checking. But we didn't know how to move that into a wider and broader set of problems like those that uh, abstract interpretation can solve. So we repair abstractions. Quickly, what is an abstraction? So imagine that you have many properties like those shapes. Deciding an abstract domain means you choose some of these shapes, in that case, the, the, the circle. And instead of computing around those shapes that have different form, you compute on the abstract. And you try to extract properties about the concrete. And this is pretty good because uh, you can get, you can prove correctness of your programs. At least theoretically, abstract interpretation is sound by construction. Then we know that when you implement, you get good to get rid of some of this uh, nice feature. The meaning of uh, being sound is the following. Well, you have a specification, you have the negation of the specification, you have uh, the, your bad states, the COVID, and then you have the program that computes on some input and it gives you some shape inside. And you want to prove that that satisfies the specification. Okay, but you want to do it without running the program. So what you need to do is to find the right shape inside the abstract domain that is the most close into the around what the program computes. That would be, if, if that happens, you're lucky. Really, really lucky. Because usually, during the abstract interpretation, which is not abstracting the result of the interpreter, is computing inductively with the abstract domain. You may lose precision. That's the lucky case because you can still prove your assertion because you are inside the specification. But usually, more often, abstract interpretation is incomplete. That means that uh, same situation as before, but during the computation of the abstract interpreter, you lose precision and you cannot anymore claim that your specification is satisfied, even if the program satisfies the, the specification. Okay, so in the literature, the problem of incompleteness and completeness of interpretation is older than Seeger, actually. It's older, it's 23 years old at least, the, refined, the first refinement that we, we studied. You can claim the following. If you are globally complete, namely, if, if it's true that uh, this uh, sentence hold, uh, this uh, equation hold for all input, then whenever it, what you can prove in the abstract domain is exactly what you can prove with respect to that specification by running the true program. And that's the best situation possible you can have. That's great. So the best situation would be let's have complete domains. Unfortunately, abstract interpretation is rarely complete. Basically, it's almost never complete. If you have an abstract domain that can see something, but cannot see everything, so it loses precision at some point, you can always build a program that foil your abstract interpreter and produce false alarms. Always. The second is that uh, the precision of the abstract interpreter depends on the way the code is written, not on the, the function computed. So it strictly depends, it's strictly intentional. It strictly depends upon the way you write code. So this is a recent result by Tim Popple, 2021. There is another aspect which influences a lot uh, the precision of the abstract interpreter. Is the input. Imagine that you have that input and you have a program that computes the smallest circle inside the, that input. Then it computes that one. Then you abstract in the shapes and you compute in the abstract domain and you are immediately incomplete. So that input, this little input, the big star, produce imprecision in the abstract interpreter. While instead, if you have that input, of course, I mean, that input runs perfectly because it remains unchanged and the abstract interpreter doesn't lose precision. So the precision of the abstract interpreter depends on the input, and that's the idea of local completeness that we introduced. We know 
since the year 2000 that any Scott continuous function, for any Scott continuous function, which is a predicate transformer in general, you can always refine an abstract domain with the most abstract domain that includes the original one and makes that function complete for all possible inputs. But this problem, which is a refinement strategy, has an issue. Take this program. This program computes triangular numbers. Well, these are not linear. And imagine that you want to prove the correctness of that program, in particular that assertion that j is bounded by 15. So you want to use intervals, which is pretty cheap domain, efficient domain. You get that invariant, and you are unable to prove that j is bounded. The invariant is here, and the post condition is here. Then you can refine the domain and go to octagons. That's pretty nice. You get better results. J is bigger than 5, but still, you're not, you don't have the answer. And if you keep going with polyhedra, you won't get the answer either. The problem with global completeness is that if you refine the, any of those domains, in particular intervals, with respect to that program, you get the whole complete domain. So it blows up. That's the idea of local completeness. Local completeness has been introduced in LIX uh, 2021. Is, the idea is pretty simple. I mean, instead of quantifying for all input, we quantify, we just consider one input locally to that input you want, you want to be complete. And of course, if this holds, then the same theorem as before holds. Namely, you can prove the correctness of your program simply by running the absolute interpreter for that input. But that's one input. The nice thing of the, that paper is that we had a proof system that allows us to prove that whether you are able to prove this triple in the proof system for local completeness, then what you can do with the abstract interpreter is exactly, proves exactly the correctness of the concrete specification for that post condition. That's very nice, but the problem is that if you inductively distribute the check of, co of completeness, so the absence of false alarms around, around the old computation, so in the program, you come up to the basic uh, functions, which gives uh, some kind of constraints on the way you want to prove completeness. You have to be locally complete for the basic transfer functions. So you need an abstraction refinement that we call it abstract, after interpretation repair. So you need to repair for that specific input in that point, that transfer function. How it works? We decided to, to produce the, the most, the simplest possible refinement. That means adding one point to your abstract domain. The point is called U. And this is the domain that is uh, obtained by embedding that point into, into the abstraction. What is that point? So in order to see how it works, uh, well, imagine that you want to be complete with respect to C, and C is computes f of C, and then it's abstracted here. Then the point that we need to add is that uh, weird uh, formula that says basically that I need to find the largest element such that that condition is satisfied. What, are, what does it mean? Imagine that this point uh, is inside. That belongs to the set. Imagine that point is inside. That belongs to the set. This is not. This is outside. Well, you don't see much the shade, but uh, it's outside. That means that what I need to add is exactly the maximum element that produce something inside that set. And we have a pretty nice uh, if and only if condition that guarantees that if we have that point, we have the best possible, most abstract, optimal refinement for that point. The point of being a local complete uh, is that it is not compositional, of course, because you have a trace considered. So imagine you have this program that's uh, in green is the interpretation in intervals. And then uh, you know that uh, you are complete only if uh, you start with any set of integers that belong to those sets above. So if it's bigger than zero, less than equal than zero, or if it contains zero, one. OK, so we consider. 2, 5, and we get, uh, as a result, on the left, uh, 0, 3, which is, whose abstraction is exactly the interval that we get by interval analysis. So you are complete. But if you compose that code with the same code, so 
you duplicate and you go down, then you will see that uh, you got an error here. Why this? Because uh, here you are not considering, you are generating something that does not belong to this. Uh, this is contains zero, so it's not here, it's not the here, and doesn't contain zero one. So it's not compositional. What does it mean? It means that we cannot uh, refine the domain and then run the after interpreter in one shot. No, we need to refine along the computational trace. So we need local completeness, need a replace strategy. And this is what we, we design in the paper. So we need to go through the, the, the trace, uh, backward or forward, of course, and produce the result. Go back to the example. So imagine that you have uh, uh, j less than one to 15 to prove. Then uh, the interval is that. I mean, we know that i was 6, but for j we have anything above. Zero. So we go backward now. So we propagate backward the assumption. And uh, what's happening is that we are able to, to cut 15 there. And then we, we are, I'm trying to go backward. So propagating backward the assertion that I want to prove in order to find the object in the domain that allows me to prove that assumption by the after interpreter. So I generate, uh, in that case, the invariant. And then the invariant is reiterated. And what I get? is a new shape, which is this one. This is the object to be added. Exactly that part. The object is the U that I need to add into the domain in order to produce a complete proof for my graph. OK, so what, what did we do eventually at the end of, the, of this talk? So this is just to give you, to clarify you the idea. We developed, we developed forward and backward strategies for uh, abstraction repair. The interesting thing is that uh, no matter if you are forward or backward, you can completely reconstruct Seeger by considering a very specific abstraction, which is a partition. So if you partition your state space, then you get Seeger. But you know that after interpretation is more general than partitions. Intervals are not partitions. If you complement an interval, you won't get an interval back. So, the nice thing of after interpretation repair is that it works for all after domains. The important thing is that they have to have a Golar connection. So for polyhedra, it's a bit uh, tricky. Okay. Second thing that we prove is that uh, after interpretation repair is uh, optimum. That means that it's the most abstract possibility you have to, to prove the things and to have the most abstract domain for proving your stuff. And last, because we are in PLDI, it cannot be just theoretical with nice theorems, but need to, to at least to hint how to, how to use it. How would I use this uh, after interpretation repair? I think that the only, that the most important use, uh, apart from a theoretical uh, result, is that it, in, it induces a notion of relative completeness. Namely, imagine that you have a very complicated and costly after domain. And you, want, you cannot afford to run the after interpreter on that after domain, which is too expensive. So what you use, you, you run the after domain into a simplified domain. And you only use the original very expensive domain along the trace of computation. So you tailor the after domain dynamically during the computation. So imagine that you want to refine along uh, the necessary point, so that becomes a star, then you get back to triangles, and then you get back to the fixed point. This is the real, probably, uh, most effective use uh, of this idea within, uh, within uh, this context. Thanks a lot. So a couple of questions. Yes. Um, first, when you presented how you, uh, the point that you add to the to the abstract domain, this U, if you squint at it, it looks like a Craig interpolant, something that is implied by the yeah. concrete, and it implies that F of it is uh, less. That, so that, I, I, yeah, that's a good point. It's definitely a way, a lattice theoretic interpretation of that object. And, and second point is, how does this relate to the fixed point iteration? So is, I guess, when you presented the loop, you presented like you, in one iteration, you, you get this triangle formula. No. No, 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 you need to iterate. Actually, in the worst case, uh, you, you can always figure out a program that adds a point. Uh, I mean, if there's an infinite chain, you keep adding points forever. 
So the point is that eventually, if you want to make it effective, you will need, uh, in, that, in those cases, a uh, widening if your relative domain is not, uh, is not the Shandin chain condition. But um, so you don't get in an immediate step. You need to iterate uh, to refine backward the construction. So whenever you have a fixed point, so a, basically a loop, you refine backward. So that's the backward strategy, similarly to what uh, Seagull does actually along the trail. So Seagull does many iterations, so you do too, and is, there is a widening concept for those iterations? Not in the paper. That's probably our next PLDI paper. But it's Thank a you. good point. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, th really interesting talk. So in the spirit of this morning, I'm going to ask a stupid question, which is, um, why do I want local completeness? I know you can prove it, but why do I care about only a few inputs? What are the use cases for that? OK, you, you can generalize this to set of inputs. Therefore, basically, I mean, having solved the problem for one input allows us to provide strategies for sets of inputs. The interesting thing is that uh, the problem is that you, you need to trade off between precision and how big becomes the after domain. With global completeness, you are fine because it, you are complete for all possible inputs. So it's compositional, it's beautiful. It works wonderful in the abstract interpreter, but the point is that the abstract domain blows up into almost the concrete all cases. So you need to find the good trade off between what you are interested in input and uh, what you want to prove about your problem. So then just a quick follow up. So the, to specify those sets, presumably you, you should pick an abstract domain in which to, to specify them. So exactly. how, do you, how do you do that? That's a, that's a point. Indeed, uh, theoretically, your abstract domain is a set, is a set of properties. So you, it builds over the, the power set of your state of state. But in practice, you need a language to, to move from the more abstract to the most, more concrete. This is why I said uh, probably the most interesting use of this is a relative completeness. So I'm relative complete with respect to a very expensive and concrete abstract domain for which I have a language to specify and design objects, but it's too complex for me. And I simply want to run in a simplified abstract domain and use the more concrete objects only when needed. And this is probably the, the real application of this. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, what happens for domains in which you don't have a Galois connection, so like polyhedron and all that? Uh, okay, no. Uh, this relies, I mean, the theory of optimality, you can do that, of course, but the optimality ensured by the theorems is proved for Galois connection based on that. That means that when you move to polyhedra, which do not belong to that family of uh, nice properties, you probably need to constrain the number of bounds and to figure out some shape that uh, embed that into a Galois connection. Of course, you can use the same idea in this case, but you won't get the optimality result. So local completeness is placing a very like different set of requirements on your abstract domain. Um, do you think this requires different kinds of abstractions to ones that are usually very successful? Yes, that's a good, very good point, because actually, uh, what, uh, the fallout of this is that um, we have uh, a kind of dynamic uh, construction of the domain along the computation, mm -hmm. along the abstract interpretation. Then, namely, during problem analysis, we change the domain at each point we need. So there, we don't have any more one abstract domain that works for all problems of my company. No, yeah. you build it dynamically and you adjust dynamically. That's the effect of this. But do you think if uh, certain domains will be uh, better suited to growing dynamically than others, which are traditionally more successful because of their initial breadth? Oh, like the linear ones seems easier to play with, right. and then you know, I mean, that's a, that's a good point for, uh, for investigating uh, families of domain that fits this very much. Okay, thanks. Um, from what I understood, you start with, you have a goal, and you... Where are you? Hi. <laughs> okay. From what I understood, you have a goal, and you refine it to be more precise to prove that goal. So do you see that's that the backward case. That, um, is it, is it, would it also be useful for like a general analysis in a compiler where you don't necessarily have a specific goal you're trying to show? That's, that would be the forward case. We have both uh, strategies and because of time constraints, I just show you the, the backward case, which is more verification-like, but you can do program analysis in the forward case in the same way. Thanks. Thanks. 